Good morning, good morning. We will just allow our guests to chime in. So I'll start in about 30 seconds. Just wanna welcome you today. Good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to this week's Downtown Download. I'm Downtown Partnerships President Shalonda Stokes is joined, as always, by the Honorable Councilman Eric Costello, who you will hear from in a minute. Just want to give a little bit of updates first. We are getting closer to the November elections. Hopefully, you've already either voted by mail, you have everything prepped, you're dropping it in a drop box, or you're prepared to vote on site. Whatever you do, we want to encourage you to get out and vote. Um, there's been talk in Washington about, you know, just another badly needed economic stimulus package. We know COVID vaccine trials have begun, but there's no real timeline for approval. So against all of this backdrop, families and businesses are trying to plan what's next for the ne next several months. What will things look like? So we thought this was the perfect time for an update from today's guest. It's Congressman John Sarbanes, who I'm sure you all know in love. He's represented Maryland's third con congressional district since 2007. And in that time, he's proven to be a bold leader, really pushing to protect the environment, provide more and more affordable health care, give public school children the tools they need to be successful, and help Marylanders survive the health and economic crisis that's really associated with COVID-19. So he's repeatedly come through with help for the district which we know that we need now more than ever. So as a son of Maryland's long time, long tenured Congressman, um, the US Senator Paul Sarbanes, our guest came to his calling, honestly, I would say, and his family is dedicated to public service. So I cannot wait, wait to hear what he has to say. Before we begin that conversation though, Council Councilman Costello and I have a few announcements. Councilman, I definitely have to start with thanking the entire team and everybody who came out to the Charles Street Promenade this past Saturday, if you missed it, you missed it. I mean, this was one of those, I don't know if you've ever heard the term FOMO, which is fear missing out. You missed out on something good. We closed a long stretch of the historic Charles Street to cars for a full 12 hours. And what this allowed was families and pedestrians from all walks to really spend a perfect day, safe and socially distanced, but really supporting those businesses. And, you know, this effort, you know, was a yeoman's job. You know, we heard over, you know, everybody put the time in, but the result was worth it because what we heard from people up and down the street was, can we do this every week? Can we do this next month? How often can we move it? And so, you know, as the councilman can tell you, it really takes a lot of work to move things. He made it look easy, councilman. Thank you, thank you from our entire team for helping make sure that we could get that done. And we know it wasn't just downtown partnership. And here it was five groups that joined us to help create that, the Charles Street Promenade. So thank you to Charles Street Development, the Central Baltimore Committee, a Midtown Community Benefits District, Mount Vernon Belvedere Association, and the Mount Vernon Place Conservatory. So thank you, thank you, thank you to each of those organizations. Have to give kudos to my team. I mean, really put the heart and soul in it. Special shout out to Lauren Hamilton and Marissa Moss on our team who who, you know, 24 seven was on it. And Mike, I love the media that, you know, you got us covering, so thank you. Had to say all of that first, um, but we're evaluating our successes. You know, we, we're looking at whether or not this was really beneficial to the restaurants. It was about generating traffic, but more so support, economic support for those restaurants. So we're hoping that the data comes back and we can do this thing again. Can't say when, but with your help, I know we'll do it. So in the meantime, if you want to find out more about what we have going on um, in downtown, the future of this organization, and hear some other special tidbits, please I invite you to attend our annual meeting. It's going to be a little bit different this year as we are also being safe and practice, practicing sort of socially distancing with a virtual experience. But we, we want to bring a little something extra to this virtual experience. So it will be on November 12th. It's going to be live. A live video, you'll see some elements of that. I don't want to give everything away, or, away. but visit our website at godowntownbaltimore.com for more information. We'll reintroduce who we are. We are DPOB. 
We're going to have some other things to make sure that people stay in tune with what's happening, not just in our downtown, but in downtowns internationally. So we'll have the president of VOMA International there, Henry Cham Chamberlain. And no event is an event without having our other special guest who will be Wes Moore. And I know you probably know him from the other Wes Moore and his work that he's doing at the Robin, Robin Hood Johnson Foundation. So with that, Councilman Costello, I know we will see you at the annual meeting as well. I know you're as psyched as I am, but let me transition to you just in case there's some other things we wanna tell about what's happening in the city. Councilman. Thanks, thanks Shalanda, appreciate it. Um, no, no real updates uh, this week. I uh, just wanna remind everyone to vote. Um, I just voted yesterday, uh, which, was, which was great. I uh, was able to drop it off at the uh, drop off location in my neighborhood. Just want to make sure everyone's uh, you know, reminded to vote and vote early. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone from the downtown partnership team who helped contribute to a very successful uh, Saturday afternoon uh, in downtown and all the way up through Mount Vernon up to Penn Station. Uh, hopefully we can do it again. I know it was a ton of work that went into it, uh, but I think it was very successful. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you know, the economic impact of, of that event. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Shalana. Thank you. I won't ask you who you voted for, but I'll just do a transition to our special guest. So <laughs> you can read between the lines. No, in there, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. It's very timely um, as we, as we want to really encourage people to get out to vote. But we also want to talk about, you know, how our community, how everybody can really engage, tap into what's happening you know, at a federal level here. So thank you for joining us today. As we discuss, and as our panelists know, we do this um, every week or other week, um, Councilman Costello will ask a few questions of you. And I would encourage our attendees to post questions in the Q&A box. And after we finish those initial question set, I'll come back and give the questions from the audience. So that, does that seem to work well? That sounds great, Shalana, I appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you for joining us, Councilman. You can take it away. Thanks, Shalanda. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for, for making yourself available for us. Uh, we appreciate everything that you're doing down in Washington. Uh, I know it's uh, certainly challenging times now. Um, so you serve as a member of the uh, House Subcommittee on Health. Uh, so I want to jump into some health-related questions. Um, early in the spring, you co-sponsored H.R. 6263, that waived cost sharing related to COVID-19 tests, essentially making it more affordable for low-income folks uh, to get tested. Uh, this month, you joined Maryland's congressional delegation to announce more than $8 million in federal funding for a Johns Hopkins study on eliminating racial and ethnic disparities when it comes to COVID-19. What do you see on the horizon in terms of additional healthcare legislation, especially related to COVID-19? Well, uh, thanks very much, Eric and Shalanda and the whole team uh, there at the Downtown Partnership. And I'm upset that I missed that thing on Charles Street because you just said if you missed it, you missed it. But hopefully it'll happen again. So you definitely got me sold for the next time around. But I want to thank you for, for what you're doing right now. Obviously, this is a hugely challenging time for uh, families, for our communities, and for small businesses and businesses really of all size and shape, particularly small businesses though, that we know have been so uh, hard hit by the challenge that we face right now with the pandemic. And I wanna salute you Shalanda and your team there for the outreach that you're doing in this difficult time. And certainly to Councilman Costello, he and I have the privilege of representing a lot of uh, Baltimoreans, the same folks because um, our districts intersect and at this time, we know that being there uh, when people reach out and need help, finding their way to the services that can help them get through this tough time, that's the most important role that we play. Good news is that we work together on that. We're seeing our federal delegation working uh, with state officials and local officials to make sure we're being as coordinated as we can in that response. And so um, it's certainly a pleasure to join you all this morning. Um, on the health front, Eric, obviously there's a direct connection between uh, making sure we're addressing the 
pandemic in an effective way and getting our economy back on track in a way that's sustainable. And one of the problems is until we get our, our arms around the pandemic and we kind of beat it back and get it under control, uh, we're going to be on this roller coaster uh, when it comes to the economy. So that kind of investment in strong health measures um, is what allows everything else to make progress. At the federal level, you pointed out some of the things we've tried to do to help individuals, um, waiving co-payments when it comes to the coverage of, of COVID testing, bringing more resources in to institutions like uh, Johns Hopkins because they, they are a real source of expertise for people and for um, uh, elected officials, I might say, because we really have to follow the guidance of the public health professionals. If we're going to be able to lead in an effective way, you certainly understand that, um, and so do I. So those resources are important. But I think one of the most critical investments we need to make right now, we're pushing very hard for this in this next round of relief and assistance, is to bring resources and a strategic plan to the way we do testing and contact tracing around the country. This is gonna be super important for businesses because for businesses to be able to open effectively and stay open, they have to have the capacity right there in the workplace, right there on their premises to do things as safely as possible. So providing that knowledge to them, providing resources so that they can do uh, whatever uh, adjustments, design adjustments, and other things needed to, need to happen in that space so that it's safe for employees and for customers. That's absolutely critical. That's a big component of the next HEROES Act, what we've been trying to put together, and we're in the midst of negotiating. We'll see how that goes. We can talk about that later for sure, but um, that focus on small businesses, workplaces, common areas, you know, where people are going to gather for one reason or another. If we don't have testing capacity to deploy there, if we don't have strategies for contact tracing and sort of monitoring and getting good eyes on the virus, then we're operating essentially in the dark and that compromises our ability to get the economy back on track as well. So that is a critical piece, working with local leaders like folks in Baltimore City uh, to gather up what's the best information on the needs of small businesses, community leaders in that space is critical to providing relief, which will actually make a difference. Thanks, Congressman. That's, that's definitely helpful. Um, so just staying on the subject of health care for a minute, um, you've been a really strong advocate of the Affordable Care Act, uh, which expanded coverage to over 20 million Americans. Uh, unfortunately, the ACA is under attack. Uh, what do you see as the, as the fate of that program? Is, is that going to stay? Um, is that going to be challenged in the Supreme Court? And, and sorry to put you on the hot seat uh, so early in the show. Uh, we, we usually wait about 20 or 30 minutes, but, but we knew you could handle it. Well, look, I'm a strong supporter of the Affordable Care Act. I have been from day one. I sit on the Health Subcommittee in Energy and Commerce, which is where we marked up uh, that bill over a period of days and weeks um, back in 2008. And um, I fought consistently to keep the ACA strong from that day forward um, in, in the face of ongoing assaults. Unfortunately, from the other side of the aisle, I'm a Democrat, Republicans have come after that fairly consistently, uh, even though out in the country, I don't, I don't think it's really that much of a partisan issue. I think that people just wanna know that they can rely on um, health, good health care coverage when the need arises, um, and it, it's not too complicated, and it's, it's something that's there um, when they have some kind of health uh, situation or challenge. So I'm going to fight to keep that strong. Um, I think the fate of the ACA, as it seems it always is every two years, depends on whatever election we're getting ready to have. 
Um, and I think that certainly uh, the Democrats in Congress and, um, and the Democrats running nationally are very strong in their support of the ACA. I can say this, um, Eric, uh, during this time where we kind of been battling over the ACA, which by the way has brought 20 million more Americans into uh, health coverage across the country. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing uh, if you think about it and we can keep building on that. But while the ACA has been sort of under attack at different times, which has made it hard for us in Washington to kind of explore the ways to strengthen it and build on it, states across the country have stepped up and they've looked at different ways of trying to improve the ACA at the local level. And Maryland's a perfect example of this. Uh, as you know, in Maryland, the premiums in the Maryland Health Exchange have declined now three years running because Maryland took steps to build a kind of reinsurance catastrophic insurance program, which has proved very successful. So I actually think that if we can get back to a place in Washington where instead of having this battle over whether to keep the ACA or get rid of it, we just decide, okay, it's here to stay. Let's make it work better. We can borrow on the example and the best practices of states like Maryland across the country have kind of been laboratories that have kept moving forward on this and we can strengthen it across the country. So Maryland is going to be, I think, a good test case for some of these improvements. And I'm definitely going to pull on that experience, you know, being a Marylander, being in touch with those in, people in Annapolis who kind of design these creative solutions um, and bring that to the committee that I'm, that I'm a member of in, in the House and see if we can get those things implemented at the national level. Look, like I said, at the end of the day, um, People don't care what name you call the health system. They just want to know that if they get sick, they can get, they can get to a decent doctor. They can go to the hospital if they need it, and they don't have to bankrupt themselves or their family in order to do it. We ought to be able, as a country, to provide that basic assurance to people. And I think that's what the ACA was uh, designed to do. And if we build on it, we can get there. Thank you. Uh, switching gears over to um, small business recovery. Um, Shalon and I have been privileged to head up uh, Mayor Young's Small Business Recovery Task Force during the pandemic. Uh, and, and we've seen firsthand how much uh, small businesses across the city, uh, and, uh, as I'm sure across the state, uh, are hurting right now. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you think is going to happen with the next relief package? I know you've been a big supporter of previous relief packages in the CARES Act, and we're certainly appreciative of that. Um, I think our audience uh, is really interested in what do you see coming down the pike next? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you for what you all are doing to try to support small businesses during this tsunami. I mean, let's face it, uh, small businesses have never experienced the shock um, of, of what we've seen over the last six months, arguably in our in recent history for sure. So um, people are exhausted by it. Many businesses are kind of on, on the precipice in terms of whether they're gonna make it or not make it. So thinking about what those lifelines can be to businesses during this difficult time um, has to be a number one priority. The other thing I'll just, mention up front here before I talk about some of the measures we've implemented and are trying to implement at the federal level is that it's really important in this time to listen carefully to small businesses, to those proprietors, small business owners, because a lot of times you can design things in the abstract that you think are going to help people or help a small business. And you have the best of intentions, but it may not work out that way on the ground. And so we have to be constantly kind of revisiting the relief packages and the measures that we're offering up to ensure that they are actually accomplishing the goals and listening to small businesses, 
listening to organizations like the Downtown Partnership, to local chambers of commerce and others, carefully when they're saying, hey, you know, time out, this thing that you just thought you did to help us is actually creating a problem, or you've missed this opportunity over here to do something that could really um, support us in this difficult time. Listening is really, really important. And understanding that that doesn't mean we're always going to get it right, but we got to be trying constantly. So at the federal level, the, the, the most important intervention right from the beginning, beginning with the CARES Act, which was the package that we put through back in, in March and April, and certainly it continues to be a focus uh, in the HEROES Act, is the, um, is the PPP program. Um, which was a new program set up through the Small Business Administration, U.S. Small Business Administration, um, to provide uh, support to small businesses, businesses and small businesses out there across the country. Now, anytime you stand up a program, essentially overnight, put billions of dollars behind it, and then try to deploy it, um, there's going to be glitches. And we certainly saw that. And the effort in the HEROES Act is to come back, um, refine the PPP program in ways that uh, make it stronger or more responsive, particularly to the smallest businesses. Because what happened in round one is some larger businesses, uh, to be very honest, that didn't really need to access the support in that program. Uh, they found a way to use their connections to grab onto some of those dollars. That meant there was less dollars going out to the smaller businesses across the country. So when we came back with an, another interim package, we strengthened the accountability there. And in the HEROES Act that we're trying to negotiate right now, um, we would do that uh, even more so, but also set aside billions of dollars within the PPP program to go to the smallest business, to go through minority depository institutions, to go to micro lenders, to go to those um, institutions and organizations on the ground that actually have these relationships with the smallest businesses. So we make sure that those dollars don't get grabbed by some other class of business interests, but they get to the folks that, that really, really need them. Also making some adjustments in terms of what qualifies for forgiveness, because with a lot of those loans, um, if businesses are able to keep employees on um, for a certain period of time, they can qualify for some forgiveness opportunities, as you know. So there's the PPP loans. Um, with some forgiveness, depending on how the business handles it, making that work better. Then there's these economic injury disaster loans, which is a traditional uh, loan that the SBA provides up to $2 million. And um, those are things that you can file for based on the situation you face as a small uh, business. Um, and there are other loans that are available that can be of assistance to these small businesses as it's coming through. So that's a critical piece. We're also trying to get in place an employee retention tax credit, which would be extremely helpful to employers of all sizes in terms of weathering this economic crisis that's coming at us. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we understand that businesses are gonna need help in terms of designing their venues, the workplace, in ways that are safe for employees and for customers. And so bringing that extra level of attention when it comes to the testing, um, providing protective equipment and so forth is also a key component of this. We know that small businesses drive the economy. Uh, when you look at the numbers, that's always been the case. And we know that you can't have a thriving economy at the local level, state or national, if your small businesses um, are sort of hanging on the edge. So any strong and sustained economic recovery, Eric, is going to have to 
involve lifting up the small businesses. And again, um, whatever input from the downtown partnership um, or from small businesses directly uh, that you can get to my office as we continue to try to refine what is the best set of interventions is going to be absolutely critical. One last thing I'll just say, we haven't mentioned it, but a key, a key part of the, um, uh, the recovery package we're trying to design um, is not just unemployment insurance benefits for people who've lost their jobs, but stimulus payments like we had in round one $1,200 per adult, $500 per dependent to get dollars into people's pockets, um, not just to help with basic necessities, uh, but to also allow them to inject that into the broader economy, um, which, which can assist uh, our businesses. And keeping state and local governments strong. There's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of state and local workers in Maryland and in Baltimore, who, if they lose their jobs, then you're losing people again, injecting stimulus into the economy. So all these things kind of work together. But if we, if we design our response with the smallest businesses in mind, the rest of it, in a sense, will flow from that. It's often, like I say, when it comes to healthcare. If we design healthcare with a focus on where the healthcare disparities in our society are, all the rest will flow from that. So small businesses are at the center of this. That's why your voice is so critical. And Shalon, I want to thank you again and your team for gathering up that perspective and sharing it with us. The Congressman and Councilman, if I could just chime in for one minute, what you're speaking, what you're saying speaks volumes. Um, in addition to the wonderful work I get to do with the councilman, I was also nominated to and serve um, on the National Women's Business Council, which, you know, for the for the group at the broader, it is a nonpartisan federal advisory committee that that offers initiative to women and small businesses, um, but it's advice and counsel to the president, to Congress, and to the SBA. And annually, we put out, you know, our recommendations and what you're talking about, Congressman, is really number one as it relates to access to capital, and that's having the SBA prioritize and make permanent approval of, of having the community development financial institutions, the CDFIs, and the minority depository institutions eligible lenders across all SBA loans. And so if you prioritize those things, it does exactly what you're talking about and really gets that into the hands of those small and or minority businesses, which as you point out, is really the lifeblood of, of how we're doing things. And if you can, and it was a conversation I know you and I had earlier, really thinking about the help of all in this. This isn't about you know, working with just one group of people, it's really everybody rallying around to figure out how for sort of the least in that right, we're all helping raise those ships together. So thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you, Congressman. That, that, um, that, that seems to make a lot of sense in, in the approach of, <clears throat> you know, thinking through what are the smallest of small businesses need and, and how do we move from there? Uh, seems like a very sensible approach. Uh, I know our small business community in Baltimore City appreciates that. Um, is there anything else we missed in, in the HEROES Act? Uh, that was definitely a lot, and I know, I know there's a lot. Of uh, a lot in there. There's a lot in there. I mean, in addition to extending again um, and strengthening, supplementing the unemployment insurance benefits, that extra $600 a week, which was really, really critical. We want to include that the $1,200 stimulus uh, payments. Um, mortgage and rental assistance is gonna be absolutely key, Eric. And, and there's, there's kind of a cliff coming with that because a lot of these moratoriums that have been put in place uh, are going to expire at the end of the year. And so while people have had forbearance on those rent and mortgage obligations, which has been very helpful, they've been accruing um, nevertheless this obligation and when the moratorium expires, if suddenly they are hit with this accumulated um, obligation to pay that back, 
um, that's going to really, I mean, that's going to knock people for a loop, obviously, and put people in a very difficult situation. So the original HEROES Act that we put forward would have had um, $75 billion in mortgage assistance across the country and $100 billion in emergency rental assistance across the country. Um, we're negotiating that, but it's still a, a key, key priority because we know that people are going to get slammed otherwise. So um, that is a critical piece. Again, the state and local governments, which as we know, uh, have suffered greatly because of the pandemic, lost revenues. Um, I mean, you look at what's happened in Baltimore City, um, the impact of the decline in, in tourism and other opportunities for I mean, you're, you're an expert in this area. You're a fiscal expert. You brought that to bear on city government. And I thank you for it because it's, it's a really important um, asset for uh, governing in Baltimore City. But you understand what's happening to city coffers as a result of the pandemic. So um, that's got to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars to make a difference. And by the way, that's something that um, Republican and Democrat governors, mayors across the country agree on. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the same um, attention to that from, from the White House that we'd like to see or from congressional Republicans, but it's not a partisan issue out in the country and by people that are on the ground, local leaders um, who have to deal with basic services. They know what the pandemic has done and they know that that assistance is critical. So that's another thing we're trying to uh, bring to bear. Of course, continuing assistance to our healthcare providers across the country because they remain on the front lines. Assistance to schools, critical. We all know that now in this kind of back to school moment. A lot of debate happening across the country at different levels about what it looks like to open a school fully, to do a hybrid opening, or to continue in a remote status. Baltimore City is an example of a jurisdiction that has to contend with those tough questions uh, every single day. But particularly when it comes to providing the um, protective equipment, the testing strategies, uh, and other supports for schools, that costs a lot of money. We want to bring it to bear. Now, one of the, you want to talk about a catch-22 on that one, one of the, the points of debate that we're having with the administration, with Steve Mnuchin, who's negotiating uh, for the president, is they only want to provide this assistance. They want to condition the assistance on the schools being open. But in order to open the schools, you need the assistance. So what we're saying to them is like, let's get these dollars flowing so schools and and Workplaces is another example, but in this instance, schools can figure out what it means to safely open. Can you do the kind of redesign of ventilation systems? How are you going to um, arrange classrooms? What kind of partitions are you gonna put in place? What are the, what's the guidance, strategic comprehensive guidance gonna be for um, school administrators and teachers, et cetera? You need real dollars to put that, that kind of response together. You can't say to, to a school system, open first, and then we'll bring you the dollars. That doesn't make any sense. So that's one of the things we're negotiating. So schools, um, healthcare providers, families providing the support with stimulus payments and unemployment insurance uh, benefits, um, a lot of uh, attention to uh, testing, contact tracing. Obviously, more broadly, we're looking at uh, research into treatments that are effective and, of course, the vaccine. Challenge with the vaccine, I will say, is that, again, as you have this debate um, where the president is kind of trying to push the vaccine, I think, faster than a lot of us on the Hill are comfortable with, and again, I sit on the health subcommittee, so we hear from these experts all the time. Um, it can have the effect of undermining the public's confidence in the process and their willingness to actually use a vaccine when we get one. So 
we want to do it right. We want to get we want to get an effective and safe vaccine. That means you go through these clinical trials carefully, um, and when you get to the end of the process, you can say to the public, "We have something that works," and then encourage people to take advantage of that. We're not there yet. It's going to take a while until we've got to a place where we can widely distribute an effective vaccine. But at that point in time, we really have to ask people to step up, be part of the solution. Um, and we've got to make sure, and this is, this is a note I kind of bring to all of the relief that flows from Washington. We got to make sure it gets to communities equally across the country because we know that um, some communities can't access this relief as easily as others. And we also know there's disproportionate impacts both uh, health-wise and from an economic standpoint on certain communities, particularly communities of color. I mean, that's the data is showing us that. So we have to adjust our response to make sure that we are addressing those gaps and disparities or we're not doing our job as federal legislators and partnering again with people like yourself um, and Shalon and others who've got that kind of local perspective on what is real and what is not real in terms of making a difference for people in their lives is absolutely critical. Congressman, that sounds like uh, one expansive piece of legislation right there. <laughs> a lot of moving pieces. So appreciate uh, all your, your efforts on that uh, to help bring support to uh, our economy. Um, I, I want to transition over to, um, mm -hmm. uh, I want to say like your niche area of expertise.